And for those who are just joining us, good morning. I'm Alexa Goodman, and I'm going to be talking about a ghostly issue, managing abandoned lost and discarded lobster fishing gear in the Bay of Fundy. Talking you through the next 20 minutes, I'm going to start by briefly summarizing my internship and its significance to my project. Then, I'll talk you through my management problem with some context, my purpose, and scope, followed by the approach used to address the issue. After I present my uh, results and inferences, I'll then present my management recommendations, and I'll have time for questions at the end. But before we dive into it, I just want to clarify that from here on out, I'm just going to call abandoned loss and discarded fishing gear ALD gear for simplicity. It's about full. <laughs> so during July and August, I had the pleasure of completing my internship in St. Andrews, New Brunswick with Funny North Fishermen's Association. Funny North represents fishers from Southwest New Brunswick, or LFA 36, and they're known globally for their ghost gear retrieval project, which I had the pleasure of working on in addition to my own research. Specifically, I worked on repurposing old fishing gear where I connected fishers and landscapers to initiate using old lobster traps as building materials for retaining walls. I also had the opportunity to design and lead repurposed rope weaving workshops, and I also led a ghost net retrieval, which you can see pictured up on the screen. Through my interviews, I also identified areas of priority for future ghost gear removal by uh, identifying ALD hotspots, which fishers had informed me on, overlaid with critical habitat for species at risk. Through working with Funny North and their fishers, it increased my understanding of ALD gear in the Bay of Fungi, and also added credibility to my management recommendations because they have, in part, been formulated based off a highly successful initiative. But before we get into more recommendations, I'm going to give you some context on the management problem. First, why lobster? Well, it's Canada's largest inshore fishery and contributes to one-third of all Canadian fishery exports. Second, there's high annual gear use. Fishers use a lot of gear and it's not always retrieved or brought back to shore for reasons which I'll discuss later. And most alarmingly, there's no estimation of how much gear remains at sea, so we don't really know how big the problem is, but this is concerning because we do know that ALD gear will affect humans and the environment in three ways primarily. First, it creates navigational hazards and safety at sea concerns because it could damage propellers or other gear. Second, it destroys the marine environment um, by harming marine life, deteriorating habitat, and it creates marine debris. And the two combined lead to economic losses from repair costs, reduced fishing time, and most notably, decreased catches. So with no clear estimation of how much gear remains at sea, but knowing the effects, that led to my research question, how can we estimate and mitigate the amount of ALD lobster gear in the Bay of Fundy? For those of you who aren't familiar with the area, the Bay of Fundy is an extension of the Gulf of Maine, located in between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and is known for having the world's highest tides, with a maximum tidal range of 50 feet at the basin heads. This makes the marine environment there very dynamic and also very biodiverse. And due to the limited time frame of this project, I restricted my scope to this area, but keep in mind that my approach and recommendations can be both applied and replicated elsewhere. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is what a typical lobster trawl configuration looks like. Trawls can range anywhere from 3 to 30 or more traps, where they're secured to the bottom, attached to a ground line, uh, with some anchors to keep it down on the bottom, and then it has an end line, also known as a buoy line, which of course has a buoy at the surface to mark the gear for retrieval. And this will come into play a little bit later on when I discuss my results. To address my research question, I conducted a total of 37 in-person interviews with 32 fishermen and five stakeholders from management agencies like DFO and fishing associations in four lobster fishing areas, also called LFAs, and you can see that they're highlighted in red on the map. The questions that I asked addressed how often and why fishers are losing gear and how it's managed from both a regulatory and community-based perspective. So thinking back to my research question, how can we estimate and mitigate the amount of ALD lobster gear in the Bay of Fundy, I've separated my results and recommendations into just that, estimation and mitigation. Keep it clear. So the primary way to estimate gear is through report. That way we can get some numbers and figure out how big the issue is. As of 2019, DFO <coughs> is changing their reporting requirements to require that all fishers across all Canadian fisheries report their losses. And as one of my management stakeholders pointed out, this is in order to continue fishery exports to the United States in showing that Canada is addressing the issue and trying to reduce threats to marine mammals. According to the data collected during my interviews, 
97% of fishers are currently not reporting their losses to management. But 90% are talking to each other and communicating their losses, either in phone or by phone, by VHF radio, or in person at the wharf. And this shows that fishers are working together to return each other's gear. No one wants to lose gear. At the end of the day, it's a costly loss. Additionally, because fishers are working together and managing this situation, some of them believe that DFO does not need to be part of solving the problem. As stated by one fisher who said, why would you report to DFO? Everyone takes care of the traps themselves. We don't need DFO to interfere with these things. Some fishers also fear the repercussions of reporting. One fisher said, with DFO, you don't know where the information goes. And therefore, some fishers fear what will be done with the information collected. <coughs> and this sort of led the conversations to go towards, well, what's the purpose? Why do we need to report? And you know, some fishers demanded to know this, and one said, with DFO, you don't know where the information goes. Oh, sorry, I just repeated the same quote. Um, here we go. He said, why are we reporting? It's more paperwork for us. What's the benefit of reporting? It's just more work for the honest guys. In terms of reporting by email, 56% of fishers said they use it, but 33% said they'd still prefer logbooks. And this is because there's a wide age demographic of fishers. You have some fishers who are quite young, you know, around their 20s, and you have some fishers who are a little bit older, in their 70s or 80s. And you know, some don't have phones, some don't have emails, and some are just not as technologically savvy, as pointed out by one fisher who said, I'm computer illiterate. And this highlights the need for choice in reporting methods that caters to all demographics so everyone can comply with new regulation. <coughs> in order to mitigate ALD lobster gear in the Bay of Fundy, we need to prevent and respond to it. But in order to identify those solutions, I needed to gain a baseline understanding of what's causing ALD gear in the Bay of Fundy. So in terms of loss, I found that all fishers lose similar amounts of gear in the same LFAs, and it largely depends on fishing experience, specific fishing locations within an LFA, gear configuration, rope length, and temporality. For the most part, fishers are losing just the trap with little rope attached. And this occurs primarily for two reasons. One, the buoy line could be cut by a propeller if the boat goes over it. And second, from being chafed off. I had never heard of this before. So thinking back to that image I had showed you earlier of the gear configuration, chafing occurs when two fishers set their gear perpendicularly on top of each other where their ground lines intersect like this. So when the bottom gear is hauled up, the ground line creates tension on the top one, causing the gear to part, and often that happens right at the trap. And so, because of this, the gear is not always retrievable because if there's no rope attached to it, the grapple that fishers use to retrieve the gear, as you can see on screen, the teeth have a hard time catching the rope. Tra attaching to the trap is, has been explained to me like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's really hard to get just the trap with no rope. And also because, for example, um, fishers might not know where their gear has gone. So if, let's say a lobster, or sorry, not a lobster trawl, if a uh, trawler for ground fish comes and attaches to uh, a trawl of gear, they could tow it somewhere else, and fishers just might not know where it went. Um, and while it sounds highly problematic that gear can't always be retrieved, it's not all bad news. Remember, fishers work together to return each other's gear, and sometimes they might find it later on in that season. Um, and the causes for these losses vary widely across LFAs, but generally occur from a combination of causes that are not fully preventable. For example, you can't help environmental conditions. You can't stop a storm from coming, and you can't really stop the tides from doing what they do. Generally, conflicts with other industries and congestion among fishers were the primary reasons for losses in each LFA. Moving on to mitigation um, in terms of retrieving old gear, 54% of fishers said they don't retrieve old gear when they come across it. And this is so because some fear fun punishment from DFO, as currently license conditions prohibit having untagged gear or gear that's tagged to someone else on board your boat. Right? They don't want to do something illegal. They know what the repercussions are. Another reason stated is that traps are no longer fishable from being in poor structural condition or from being grassed up, covered in algae and other benthic organisms, as you can see in this photo here. And this has given rise to the argument that ALD traps create artificial habitat. Now, while in some cases they may for certain organisms, and in some cases lobsters, this may not always be the case, because lobsters can sometimes still become entrapped and die, as fishers have informed me during my interviews. 
Also, it's important to note that the chaps are made of mixed materials. They're wire, coated in plastic. And it's been shown that as the plastic breaks down, the BPAs can enter the lobster's hormone systems and potentially lead to shell disease. So I just want to reiterate that while old lobster traps can create habitat in some cases, it may not always create suitable habitat for lobsters. And this points to an issue of understanding and highlights the need to create awareness, better awareness and education among fishers on the causes and consequences of ALD gear. <coughs> when I asked if illegal discarding of gear actually was still a problem, 38% of the <coughs> said that it was. But take this with a grain of salt. In actuality, this number is probably much higher because getting people to admit that they're doing something illegal is really not that easy. <laughs> so the fact that you've got 38% of people to admit that they're still doing it or know someone is uh, a success in itself. Or a failure, I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, so while ropes can be recycled because the traps are made of mixed materials, it makes things a little more tricky. To bring it to a landfill, it could be far. You could have to make multiple trips. You might have to pay to dispose of it. There could be capacity limits. You may have to partly dismantle your gear. And for fishers, that doesn't really incentivize them to properly dispose of the gear. Uh, but I just want to bring it back to Funny North, who has been such a great example of uh, a way to repurpose old gear, because as I said, they're using old traps to build retaining walls. Um, so based on my findings, it's clear that ALD gear is a problem. But fortunately, there is a very clear path forward as well. So in terms of gaining an estimation of how much gear remains at sea, it's recommended that DFO includes choice in reporting methods to cater to all age demographics. And also, they should clearly explain their purpose in order to increase compliance. Last, to prevent illegal discarding, we need to implement proper waste management strategies across all LFAs. So we know that marine debris is undeniably a wicked problem worldwide, as Crystal alluded to earlier, and we need to deal with it. ALD contributes to the problem, and we have an opportunity to right this wrong. Fishers and stakeholders are willing to work together to solve this issue, and although barriers do exist, collaboration can help mitigate some of the issues I identified. In addressing ALD gear, we can help protect both the ocean and our shared marine environment, and ultimately improve Canadian fisheries. With that, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Sean Gallant, uh, my internship host, Funny North Fishermen's Association, um, specifically Lillian, Darlene, Maria, and Leslie, all of my study participants, especially fishers. It's really hard to mobilize fishers and get them in one place at a certain time. They're very, very busy. Uh, Gary Party for creating my study area map, the map faculty for all your support and guidance. Of course, my class for being awesome. Um, my friends and my family, shout out to my parents for coming all the way here for both days. Um, everyone who sponsored me um, for SOA's Youth Leadership Summit in Bali where I got to present my research. And of course my local and global network for continuing to support me and getting my work out there. Uh, thank you all so much and I hope you enjoyed. Um, I also want to point out that Alexa has been asked to be on a panel and present some of this work at the Fishermen and Scientists Research Society meeting in March. So, congratulations. Mm. So, we are open for questions. Emma. Um, so, would like, so for the Bay of Fundy, would a tracking, sort of like a tracking program be a goal for the future? I think in the future, yes, uh, technology is definitely part of the situation. I didn't really get in too much about the hotspot mapping, um, but based off the symmetry and you know ties and all of that, there are areas where gear tends to accumulate. Okay. Um, so you know maybe using uh, GPS tracking or tagging could help predict where the traps end up. Um, but I have a feeling as robust technology continues to roll out, uh, potentially that can maybe be integrated into the solution. I'm sorry. Do you think that the <coughs> dynamic environment of Bay of Fundy with the tides could pose a challenge for either a tracking program or uh, gear that is not attached to the uh, Well, yes, it definitely creates a barrier. It definitely creates a problem. Um, but, I mean, you can't, like, you can't stop the environment from being the environment. You just have to sort of deal with it. Um, but I think working with fishers in a participatory way and getting them to help map of where this year ends up as sort of critical. Um, the work I did with Funny North was great. Um, you know, I've, I had these large maps and fishers just pointed out exactly where they know where gear accumulates or where they're constantly losing gear. Um, so that's kind of the answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alex? Um, 
Do you think it makes sense to talk about abandoned, lost, and discarded gear um, as a group? Because in your presentation, you sort of alluded to the fact that these have kind of a disparate variety of causes. Um, so the, <coughs> yes and no. It's hard to separate abandoned, lost, and discarded gear because once it's in the water, how do you know if it was abandoned, lost, or discarded? You don't really know. That's why it's kind of grouped together. Uh, the literature also reflects it altogether, but very limited the literature there is. Um, although they do have to be treated separately. The issue of discarding has different causes versus losing gear. And the reason why gear is abandoned most of the time is because they can't retrieve it. They try, you know, for various reasons, and they can dangerous or does that answer your question? Yeah. Peter? Now maybe I missed this, but uh, you, there are no estimates of the number of lobster, lost lobster traps in the Bay of Fundy? No. Mm -hmm. There is no estimate at all of how many lobster traps uh, remain on the bottom, um, which is why the FO is changing their license conditions to just get an estimate. Um, well, can you put a figure on that? 1,000, 10,000, 100,000? I, mean, I would say. Based on all the effort lobster in over, over the decade? Take this with a grain of salt because there really was no estimation because that was a question that I asked. Mm -hmm. I would say it's probably around 1% of the total of traps per year. But for example, a fisher could lose a whole trawl, yeah. maybe 20 traps one year, and then for the next two years he loses nothing, and maybe he retrieves four traps from someone else. So this is why, again, in my mm -hmm. recommendations, I said that we need to require reporting of losses and retrievals just to have that, that full picture. But even in other fisheries uh, in Atlantic Canada, there was really, really limited information. Uh, most of it was with respect to the gillnet fishery, and a lot of it's outdated. There isn't really a gillnet fishery anymore. Thank you. No, please. I'm not sure. I don't know your name. Yeah, Me? in the back. Yeah. Oh, I just arrived. Great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, yeah, just in terms of reporting, I saw that you said, this may have been when you were interviewing people, 56% said that they would report by email. 33% said they would report by logbooks. Did the other 11 say like they just wouldn't report? Or um, there was a few other options. One of them was through tag suppliers. Okay. Um, so getting into the full intricacies of tag suppliers is a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation. But tag suppliers are kind of an intermediary between the DFO and fishers. Um, and you have to work with fishing associations and tag suppliers anyways. You have to get your tags through them. Um, and they're already a trusted source, sort of building off what uh, Curtis was saying. They're a face behind all of this. You know, you such a yeah, funny article, I'll just use them as an example. You go into the office, there's someone sitting at a desk, you have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. um, and that might help reduce some of the trust issues. Yeah. Because with reporting to DFO, like you said, there's no face behind it. People don't really know where it goes. Thanks. Yeah, Charger. There seems to be fundamental distrust um, DFO as a regulating body and as a top-down approach to the body. Is there okay, just a thought? Do you have some ideas of how that could be mitigated in a way? I truly believe that participatory approaches and collaboration is the best way to build trust, and I touch about this uh, quite a bit in my paper. Um, but by allowing fishers to participate in solving the problem, it can potentially help build trust, but it needs to be you know, a two-way street. We need DFO's involvement, and DFO needs to take a little bit of responsibility in, in how they fit in, and it, it, it has to be a, kind of a, a blend. Um, you mentioned that fishers need to better understand the issue or need to know why um, reporting gear is important in order to improve compliance, but you also mentioned that it's really hard to reach fishers and there's a, some element of distrust. So where do you think that information needs to come from and how do you get it to the fishers in order to? Hmm. I think this information has to come from fishing associations. I don't think it can come from an outsider. I can't go into somewhere and be like, this is what we need to do. Um, gaining trust with fishers was really challenging. Um, you know, I'm an outsider to begin with. I called, you know, making calls, emails, it was uh, stressful. So I think it has to come with fishing associations. And I don't think it should be just, uh, just on ghost gear. The fishery has a multitude of issues, and fishers need to have, be able to identify the, the issues primarily themselves. And for some fishers, this might not be at the, the top of all the issues they're facing. Yeah. For example, just comparing, um, just to go back to my map here. Um, <coughs> um, I didn't go into the differences between LFAs, um, but lobster fishing area 36 is in southwest New Brunswick, kind of up there, and lobster fishing area 34 is this big one. Um, and lobster fishing area 34 has m many more fishers. I'm talking 900 and something versus 
lots of fishing area, 36 was housed, maybe 130, 175. And for a group of fishers that's smaller, getting them together in one situation to have a meeting to talk about the issues might be effective. Um, but in Area 34, because it's so large, you might need to have smaller pockets and allow, you know, maybe facilitate focus groups and allow them to bring the issues forward and you have to have a really strong moderator to kind of help gauge that programming. Um, but I think it has to be a long-term solution, not a one-stop. Here's an infographic, so we're going 